is the spectacular Spider-Man as great as we remember? In this video series, that's the question I'm gonna try and answer for myself by going through and analyzing all 26 episodes. Let's do it. There's a lot to love about the spectacular Spider-Man's opening episode. First, it dispenses with the origin story and plops us right into Peter Parker's world. Now, as much as I love watching Uncle Ben bite it, this is nice because now we can focus on some other Spider-Man stories quickly. However, there is a potential weakness here. I mean, there's a reason why the with great power comes great responsibility speech is so well known, and why so many superhero stories start with the superhero getting their powers. Without that information, it can be easy to feel distant from the character's emotions, from their central struggles and conflicts. However, the spectacular Spider-Man manages to get the best of both worlds by opting to go over this part later in a pretty darn creative flashback. That way, we don't miss out on this key information, but it also doesn't potentially bog down the pacing toward the start. It also helps that the writers for this show clearly understood the character well on a moment-to-moment -moment level. What I mean is that his quips and general attitude just feel right to me. Like, I've always known that he's supposed to be a bit dorky, but this is the first time I've watched a version of him that really feels balanced between his superhuman side and his nerdy side. He feels like a teenager in a costume trying to be cool, and that's not a negative. It's genuine. Maybe he's portrayed that way in other superhero cartoons, but I haven't seen those ones, so this is still pretty special. Additionally, Josh Keaton does a fantastic job as this character, nailing the highs and lows of his emotions pretty much to perfection. But the writers don't just understand Spider-Man on this smaller level, they understand him on a larger scale too. See, the spectacular Spider-Man starts us off at a new stage in Peter Parker's life. He's returning to school for the first time since gaining his powers. Before, he was bullied, but now, now everything is gonna change. His newfound confidence as Spider-Man is bleeding into his school life. However, as we soon see, things aren't so simple. These people don't know he's Spider-Man, and his Spidey skill set doesn't necessarily translate over to high school all that well. But this isn't the end of Peter's struggles. No, his Aunt May is having trouble paying the bills, so he needs to find some way to help. On top of that, being Spider-Man has already caused some more subtle issues for Peter. For example, Harry mentions that he spent the whole summer bored, and that it would have at least been nice to experience that boredom with Peter. So now we know that Peter is neglecting his friendships and personal responsibilities. For now, that neglect is fairly minor and innocuous, but this is an issue that will grow in importance as the show continues. Introducing it so naturally right now is a great decision. All in all, the show is making it clear that it understands something central about its titular character. Spider-Man isn't always a benefit to Peter Parker. In fact, at many times, Spider-Man's and Peter's interests and responsibilities will be at odds with one another. So Peter needs to get home by 10 to keep Aunt May happy, but Spider-Man needs to stay out late saving the city. Peter needs to be on time for his lab job, but Spider-Man needs to give Norman Osborn a helping hand. This show is keenly aware of this from the start, and will continue to build up similar conflicts throughout its entire run. The spectacular Spider-Man also fleshes out its world in a similar manner. Minor and major characters alike will frequently appear long before they're all that important. For example, though this episode's major Spider-Man conflict focuses on Norman Osborn and the Vulture, we're still introduced to characters who will later become Sandman, Rhino, Dr. Octopus, Venom, Shocker, Ricochet, Ox, and more. This is something the show will continue doing throughout its run, even with someone as simple as the high school drama teacher. While rewatching and noticing details like this is enjoyable in and of itself, a little reward for paying attention. Even more importantly, it makes this world feel alive and cohesive. This is adeptly accomplished by putting these characters in positions that need to be occupied anyway. What I mean is that anyone could be Norman's scientist, but hey, it might as well be a character who will be more relevant later. That's some good narrative economy, baby. This way the show manages to juggle loads of characters without giving the audience too much information at once or bogging down the pace. In a lot of ways, the second episode follows up on the first one in an expected manner. There's Peter's Aunt May alarm he's set up for his newfound 10 o'clock curfew. There's Peter trying to use his powers to get to school in time, but it not working out particularly well for him. In contrast though, there's Peter actually being able to use his spider powers to help himself, which is important to show early on. After all, Spider-Man isn't only a nuisance to Peter. He can use some of these abilities to make his everyday life better. Really, this conflict is all about balance between the two, and in order for that balance to feel legitimate, we need to see both the good and bad that Spider-Man can do for Peter Parker. So then, what completely new stuff does this episode bring to the table? Well, for one, we've got Max, who works at Kurt Connors' lab. However, freak accident soon turns him into Electro, and now Spider-Man needs to battle this baddie. The central thrust of Peter's conflict with Electro comes down to this. Peter immediately assumes Electro is a threat, so he attacks. But he later realizes that he made a mistake. By attacking, he escalated the situation, turning Electro more violent. In fact, his quips are what gives Electro his name itself. A clear way of showing how Peter isn't taking this seriously enough, or at least that he doesn't understand the impact his words can have on these other super-powered people. While I like this idea a lot, 
it really doesn't receive much focus in this episode outside of what I just mentioned. Like, yeah, Peter realizes he screwed up, tries to apologize, and it doesn't work out. But that's it. I wish this was used to delve into Peter's character a bit more. I'd expect him to feel guiltier about the part he played in this, but instead, he moves past it with ease, quickly saying that you can't control everything. The trick is to never stop trying to reach out. I mean, yeah, sure, that's a nice message, but Max isn't doing so hot. Of course, I get that the series has other things to focus on, but this still feels like a missed opportunity to take a decent dynamic and make it something truly great by giving it more time, focus, and consideration. As it stands though, this episode still uses the Electro Conflict well as a vehicle to explore Peter's difficulties balancing what his Aunt May wants with the crazy crap he's gotta deal with. There's a real sense he won't be able to please everyone. While that's hard enough as is, this becomes even more difficult when he can't explain why he's failing to live up to his promises and responsibilities to those closest to him. This is where episode 3 comes in. Kurt, otherwise known as the worst scientist in the world, I mean, who the heck injects themselves with lizard juice that's just been laying around for who knows how long? Just use a new vial, dummy. But yeah, um, Kurt is experimenting on himself. In the end, he manages to grow a new arm, but that arm comes with a cost. He becomes the lizard. Now Spidey's gotta get him back to normal. The strength of this episode comes from the way it pushes Peter to his limits by making it so he can't keep the proper balance between his life as Peter and as Spider-Man. See, when Kurt goes lizard mode, Peter obviously has to go and try to stop him as Spidey, but that means running away from Kurt's wife and Gwen without any proper excuse. Which he does, putting his responsibility to those close to him first, but also lowering their opinion of Peter in the process. Sometimes Spider-Man will harm Peter and vice versa. This is explored further when Peter's Aunt May alarm goes off, alerting the lizard to his presence. These two lives of his are getting in one another's way, and a natural question is rising to the surface. Will he be able to keep this up? Of course, this gets even worse when he takes pictures of this battle and sends them to the Daily Bugle. Though he's netted himself some cash for Aunt May, he's inadvertently made himself look real bad to some of his closest friends. Earlier, his friends could at least assume he was afraid and made a poor choice, but now, well, now it seems like he put fat stacks above their well-being, and even to the detriment of their well-being, by getting the pictures published. Now, unlike the earlier moment I mentioned, this didn't need to be a problem for Peter. I mean, if he just had some foresight, he could have realized how badly this would come across. But that's not a negative. In fact, I think it's a strength. Keeping these identities in check is incredibly tricky, and Peter is going to make some mistakes. He simply has too many things to think about, too many people looking to him for help. So he slips. So he doesn't consider things fully. And sometimes, he plays a part in making his worst enemies. Even if he is hyper-competent, he's still a kid, and he's going to make mistakes. That's part of being human, and that's part of what makes this version of Peter a fleshed-out person. Which is why the end of this episode is brilliant. Peter's friends are pissed and he's been fired from his lab job. Even though he knows he did so much right, he's once again forced to take the hit. So he steals the gene cleanser they made for Kurt, and he has a way out. He can guzzle this back and say bye bye to his pesky spider problems. And after seeing how this turned out, I can't blame him for considering this option. In fact, this whole episode has been used to show us why getting rid of these powers could be great for him. So when Peter remembers Uncle Ben's words and decides that he won't do it because the world needs Spider-Man, it's incredibly heroic and endearing. In that moment, he's willing to shoulder this ridicule and pain for the betterment of others. He's willing to do what's right, no matter how hard that is. It's Peter Parker at his most likable and real and vulnerable, and it's a great way to end the show's first arc. Unfortunately though, I don't think the second arc fares so well. Honestly, uh, I didn't enjoy these episodes much at all. Now, that's not to say they're without their strengths. For one, they continue to delve into Peter's difficulties with interpersonal relationships as he struggles to keep his promises to Harry. Since the Green Goblin arc is right around the corner, this makes sense. There are also some great moments for minor characters. Jonah Jameson protecting Peter is one of the best. I will never get tired of the jerk with the heart of gold shtick, and Jonah is a top tier example of that trope. Also, Spider-Man saves George Stacy, and even though little attention is brought to it, I like to think that's why Georgie Boy trusts and defends Spider-Man later on. Other than that though, eh. Here, Peter's mainly focused on finding a date for the fall formal. This plot is used to build up Gwen's interest in Peter and his obvious inability to notice. Boys, am I right? However, since so much time is devoted to it, I kept expecting there to be deeper growth or introspection related to this from Peter, but that just doesn't happen. See, during these episodes, Aunt May mentions that she knows a girl with a nice personality who might want to go to the formal with Peter, but Peter shivers at the thought. A girl? 
with a good personality? Next thing you know, there will be life on Mars. At least that's the vibe I get from this. So Peter spends this time hitting on Betty Brandt, a grown woman who works at the Bugle, which is pretty painful to watch at times, but hey, puberty. In the end though, he's left dateless, but fortunately Aunt May's got him covered. Miss Nice personality is gonna go with him. The twist? Huh, she's not actually a bad date because guess what folks? She's hot. Pew, 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 pew. Who would have seen that coming? Here, instead of getting a moment of potential growth for Peter, we toss in a typical trope and leave it be. It's just such a boring, predictable way to take this plot, and considering that three episodes spend a good deal of time focusing on this, I needed something more. Beyond that, Mary Jane herself is incredibly one note for a long time in this show. Really, her most identifiable character trait to me is her saying, Tiger, 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 tiger. And her voice. Like, I get that they wanted to make her attractive for the boys back home, but this way almost everything she says feels forced and off. On the Spider-Man side of things, we have Norman working for the big man to create super villains that'll keep Spidey busy. So they do just that, starting with Shocker in episode four. I don't have much to say about Shocker. He's got a nice Southern accent, I guess. His only meaningful connection to Peter comes from him saying, a man has to honor his responsibilities, and Peter parroting those words later in the episode. But the fact they came from Shocker doesn't really mean anything. Like, sure, he said it, but so what? There are no interesting parallels between him and Spider-Man. No interesting element of Shocker to grasp onto that's going to teach us more about Peter. Sandman and Rhino have a bit more to them in the following episodes, though. After all, one thing we're supposed to learn in this arc is that supervillains, in part, are becoming more common as a response to Spider-Man. So having these mooks he handily defeated before return, but bigger and stronger and better, well, that's a good way of showing how New York is changing. Spider-Man may be doing good, but the bad guys are stepping it up, too. Which is exactly what Peter learns when he meets with Tombstone, the man behind so much of New York's crime. Because Tombstone talks about how he'll continue creating threats for Spider-Man. However, Spider-Man has an out. He can work for Tombstone, who will let him stop most crimes. All he needs to do is look the other way from time to time. However, Peter is unwilling, and he says he will stop Tombstone. Well, I don't mind these ideas, in fact, I think they're pretty cool. I can't help but feel that very little actually happened in these episodes. Really, Peter's conflicts feel like they're spinning their wheels. Once again, he has to feign incompetence to keep his secret identity in check. He has trouble with his friends, the fall formal thing doesn't really go anywhere interesting. Meanwhile, the Spider-Man side of stuff is mostly devoted to lengthy fight scenes with little in the way of emotion. I mean, I enjoy the animation and presentation in a lot of these, but I can't help but wish some time was taken from them and used instead to build up the villains' personalities and motivations before the fights themselves. Sure, that'd make for shorter fights, but I'd rather have a shorter fight I feel personally invested in than a longer one that exists as little more than spectacle to me. But hey, I got to hear Spider-Man say this line. Tell Mama. Who's the big man? So that's something special. It, just excuse me, uh, I, I gotta go take a cold shower. Speaking again when wild though, the spectacular Spider-Man's next arc features Harry Osborn getting addicted to Mountain Dew, along with the Green Goblin conflict. Oddly enough though, I'm not going to discuss Green Goblin much yet because everything isn't as it seems with good old Gobby. Don't worry though, I won't forget about you. I promise. However, there's other stuff to discuss in these episodes. For instance, in episode 7, the Green Goblin attacks this fancy dinner party that Tombstone's at, putting a whole lot of other people in danger. As such, Spider-Man swoops in to save the day. In the process, he misses out on most of the fall formal he's been so focused on for the last few episodes. Another case where Spider-Man gets in the way of Peter Parker's life. However, the new element this episode brings to the table comes at the end. When Tombstone tells Spider-Man this is just the sort of protection he was willing to pay him for, but now he's simply done it for free. The point is clear. Before, these were mostly one-off baddies, but now there's a larger battle, a man with a plan and conflicts bigger than him, and charging into a fight might not always work out all that well. He may even end up helping his enemies. And these problems he's dealing with as Spider-Man will only make it harder for him to keep up with his responsibilities as Peter Parker, which is a big part of the reason why he doesn't help Harry with his addiction or acknowledge his struggles. Following this, episode 8 focuses on Dr. Octavius' transformation from scientist to supervillain. So far, Doc Ock has been a meek and mild fellow, someone who does what he's told, even if he doesn't like it. However, in this episode, it's like a switch flips in his brain. Suddenly, he's this confident criminal. The only real hint we get of this side of him comes in the episode itself, when he imagines himself kicking Norman's keister. Unfortunately, since this change happens at the drop of the hat, I didn't really care for it. 
If they had shown more of his violent visions earlier, then sure, I could have seen this coming. I guess it could be that he was simply at his breaking point and this finally pushed him over the edge. But even if that is the case, it didn't connect with me. Really, this is another case of a villain who gets plenty of screen time fighting Spider-Man, but not all that much time being developed themselves. Which means I also don't really care about these lengthy battles. If there's going to be a lot of other stuff going on in an episode, I can accept a somewhat uninteresting villain or a villain who doesn't get all that much focus. But when this comprises the bulk of the episode, eh, that's when I become Sleepy Man. Fortunately, the final episode in this arc poses a more interesting challenge for Peter. See, when he discovers that Harry is seemingly the Green Goblin, he has a choice to make. Turn in this criminal, or protect his friend and give him a second chance. As expected, he protects him, saying that the Green Goblin will remain a mystery. And it's in this moment that we see his feelings as Peter impacting his ability to work as Spider-Man, leaving him open to manipulation. After all, once he thinks that Harry is the Goblin, his judgement gets clouded, and he doesn't realise that this doesn't really make sense. Harry is a high schooler, and not a particularly strong or smart one either. Sure, a good guzzle of the Globulin Green might help him perform better in football, but suddenly becoming a criminal who can gather gangles of goons? Eh, that seems like a bit of a stretch. And fortunately, the show realises that. Because as we're going to learn much later, Harry isn't the Green Goblin. No, the Green Goblin is… well, we'll get to that a bit later. As we can see here though, these villains are becoming more personal to Peter, blurring the lines between his regular life and Spider-Man's life. In this way, we get a natural escalation of the show's central challenge. Can Peter keep these lives separate? And can he do that while meeting his responsibilities? And the next villain will only make that more difficult. See, over the course of the previous arc, there was a seemingly random subplot involving John Jameson going to outer space and performing an emergency landing. However, this wasn't as unrelated as it initially appeared, because the symbiote hitched a ride on the space shuttle, and that's what this arc is all about. Naturally, the symbiote plot is about the corruption of Spider-Man, seeing how it feeds something negative inside him that will need to be addressed. So it's incredibly smart that this arc begins by giving Peter a reason to be pissed off. See, so far, Peter selling pictures of Spider-Man to the Daily Bugle has gone pretty well, at least as far as his life as Spider-Man is concerned. In other words, even if his friends got angry at Peter for how he went about this, the Bugle hasn't really lowered people's opinions of Spider-Man. Sure, sometimes they didn't cast him in the most flattering light, but there was nothing to outright dismantle his position as a superhero. But now, the Bugle believes that Spider-Man purposely stole the symbiote, and the pictures that Peter provided are used against him. This shows something key. Even though he didn't do anything morally wrong, Peter's attempt to use Spider-Man for his and Aunt May's benefit is backfiring. This identity he takes on is out of his control. And the episode builds on that idea as the chameleon assumes his persona, bringing public opinion of Spider-Man to an all-time low. It's a fantastic way of showing that now, Peter isn't the only one coming across worse to others due to his secret identity. No, the same thing is happening to Spider-Man, and Peter's desire to protect his friends is making it easier for others to lie about him and even pretend to be him. As George Stacy says, as long as you wear a mask, some folks will always wonder. And in a strange twist of fate, some of those who are most against Peter are the least against Spider-Man, leaving him in a confused state. If the gap between these two sides of him is growing, where does that leave him? How's he going to navigate his own feelings and the feelings of others as this becomes more complex? Well, one thing this leads to is Peter feeling like he deserves a lucky break, or at least some help as Spider-Man, which is exactly what the symbiote gives him. Finally, he has something that knows about both sides of him, that helps him fight as Spider-Man and makes Peter Parker's life more convenient too. Really, all this crap Peter's gone through up till now makes the moment he decides to keep the symbiote entirely earned. He's making a mistake, but a mistake that makes perfect sense for his character. The next episode goes on to sell the utility of the symbiote to the audience, showing us that, even if Peter made a mistake by keeping it, there is a lot of good it can do for him. After all, now six previously defeated villains have teamed up against him, resulting in the first fight where he has no other option but to turn tail and run. So, when the symbiote uses Peter's body to take out the Sinister Six on its own, well, all at once, its utility and danger are at the forefront of our minds. However, it also importantly shows us that this creature is eliminating Peter Parker, erasing him from the equation. A fact that immediately has a negative impact on his life, as he doesn't realize that Aunt May's had a heart attack until hours and hours after the fact. From here, Peter's personality begins to change. He snaps at those he cares about, when he gets a big hospital bill, he takes Tombstone's deal, and oddly enough, it's only Flash who manages to snap him out of it. 
As Peter says, if Flash is making sense, something is definitely wrong. So Peter spends the rest of the episode battling with the symbiote in an attempt to separate himself from it and regain control of his person. In some ways, this sequence is incredibly clever. Sure, we skipped Peter's backstory earlier, but now we get that stuff, as Peter has visions of his past during an internal struggle with the symbiote. This way, typical Spider-Man origin stories are recontextualized as Peter going back and remembering why he needs to be Spider-Man, remembering the words his uncle spoke to him and some of the correct decisions he's made only because he took the harder path. So taking the easy path now, the symbiote's path of hate, he can't do that. He has too many people who care about him, too many people counting on him to do the right thing. It's probably clear that, conceptually, I think this conflict is great, fantastic even. However, I'm not a huge fan of some of the presentation here. Certain pieces of imagery got a chuckle out of me when I should have been at my most emotionally invested, but I can still forgive that since there's so much good stuff here too. However, what I can't forgive is the next moment, which drives me absolutely bonkers. See, during these last couple episodes, Eddie Brock has been on a serious downward spiral. He's gone from frustrated at Peter to hating him, and he's pretty pissed at Spider-Man too, which totally makes sense. From his perspective, Peter is a coward who ran off to take pictures when his friends needed him most on multiple occasions, and Spider-Man stole the symbiote. So both these guys are going to cost him his job, forcing him to drop out of school. His best friend has failed him, and the supposed superhero is sabotaging his life. In the end, this will serve as the ultimate example of Peter's inability to properly juggle this double life, leading to an extremely personal villain's existence. Now, all this sounds pretty great. So what's the problem? Well, despite a whole lot of strong setup, the moment where Eddie becomes Venom is real silly in a way that totally cheapens this conflict for me. Because when Spider-Man returns to the lab with the symbiote in hand, Eddie's there too. He's excited, ecstatic. Spider-Man brought back the thing that will get his life back on track. So what's Peter do? Well, he tries to kill the thing by freezing it without explaining a single thing to Eddie, and then he takes off before even making sure the job is done. Peter's made many mistakes in the past, and I've accepted and even praised them because the show made them believable. This though? This is just Peter making an exceptionally dumb and out of character decision for the sake of the plot progressing. I find it extremely hard to believe that he wouldn't at least try to explain this to Eddie. But hey, let's say that he wouldn't. Let's give the benefit of the doubt and assume he's so pissed off at Eddie right now that he doesn't want to bother explaining a thing. Well then wouldn't he at least wait to make sure the symbiote is actually destroyed? Why would he take off like this? It's a shame, but this forced miscommunication, this contrived frustrating moment, it taints every Venom moment following it because in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking that this just shouldn't have happened. Which is really disappointing because the final episode of the season has a lot of great ideas. Again, Venom is the ideal villain to end this season with because unlike previous villains, he's a pointed threat for both Peter Parker and Spider-Man. These two sides of his life, which he's been able to keep mostly separated even with some difficulty, are crashing together in an appropriately climactic fashion. Gwen's in danger, Eddie's his enemy, and in the end, it's the relationships he's built as both Peter and Spider-Man that give him the strength he needs to defeat the symbiote. After all this, Peter goes back home and dumps the gene cleanser down the sink. Sure, Spider-Man doesn't always make his life better, but he helps others, and Peter has a responsibility to use this power for the greater good. All this is to say that, if you can look past this scene and see the good side of this, I totally understand. It's following up on the themes and lessons of the season exceptionally well. But for someone like me who gets hung up on this silly plot stuff, honestly, the end of the season left me disappointed and frustrated. However, I'd be remiss to focus on the negatives too much. For one, I really enjoyed the season's first arc, and I enjoyed most of the final arc too. So who knows, maybe season 2 will manage to raise my opinion of the show overall, and get me liking it even more. Maybe it will even be great. But I guess we'll find that out next time, when I discuss the rest of this cartoon. Be sure to subscribe and ring the notification bell if you're interested in that. Also, if you really liked this video, you can check out my Patreon. All these wonderful people's names are scrolling by, those are the people supporting me over there, and they're awesome. Either way though, thank you for watching this video, I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you next time.